vintage watches these days, man. I I, uh, I I was purchasing vintage left and right, and then I stopped. And, and I insisted on getting just new pieces because I uh, modern pieces are going to last longer. But there are so many designs out there that are far superior and just non-existent in today's market. Yeah. This, this dynamic in particular, like, you're not going to find this aesthetic on a modern watch. And the fact that it's aged so beautifully, it's, I don't know. Yeah. You, you, can't, you can't find that nowadays. Agree. And now people are, there's this whole fad about, like, fake <clears throat> vintage with, like, aged loom. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Hi guys, I'm Patrick. I'm Adam. And this is Clock, Stock, and, and Barrel, Barrel, where we deliver a consumer's opinion on everything watch related. So guys, we have a video for you today regarding vintage. Yes, specifically new vintage, <laughs> Yes, as I like to call it. Because it's not, it's technically, it's, vintage is anything over 25 years or older, right? Well, how can In the get, car world, that's like That's when you can get the vintage place. plate, yeah, right? The black yeah. vintage car plate, 25 years or older? Yeah. 25 so, years older. So we'll call it we'll call it new vintage. I mean, a lot of people will disagree with us because the, the pieces that we're going to be talking about mostly today are like 90s, years old. you know, yeah. kind of mid, early, late 90s or so. And that's um, why we say new vintage because these are yeah. watches encroaching on the territory of being <clears throat> uh, true vintage. And, um, you know, it's not going to be much longer till my dynamic is, is actual vintage. Actual vintage. So why don't we take a gander at this. Uh, you guys saw me do an unboxing recently. So uh, on my wrist today, I have a Omega Dynamic Automatic. This is the third generation of the Dynamic line and the one uh, Omega ended on. This, um, you know, it was sort of a, a marketing mishap. Like these watches did not do well, um, but there's only so few of them. This was made in 1997 to 99, this particular model. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the new vintage pieces we're talking about. It has a beautiful aged uh, tritium numerals. It's just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, watch. I love that piece. 38, uh, 30 millimeters for a, a chrono like that with no no crown guards is, is such a great look. And just look at those pushers. With There's... two, two sub-dials too. I mean, of course, like Ben Clymer would definitely agree. <laughs> <laughs> What's not to like, man? And those yellow accents? <clears throat> yeah. Oh, get yeah. in there. Get in me. So what do you have on today? So, uh, not in the spirit of this video, I'm actually <laughs> rocking my um, Oris Aquas with gradient blue. And this is just gradient new, new for you. Red. Yeah, I mean, this, this is not vintage whatsoever. This is new, 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 new. But so, um, Adam had the piece. El Hero. He 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 returned it. And yeah. He wound up just getting straight yeah, up steel, steel with a blue sunburst yeah. dial. We'll it do was a the right review. choice. We'll do a review and kind of talk about it. We might touch on you know as you can tell if you've watched our videos before we're very much fans of Oris so yeah. we'll definitely touch back on For that sure. later. But but guys, the, kind of the point of this video really is we kind of want to address the sweet spot. And vintage, or mm -hmm. at least the sweet spot that I found and that you have found too, with yes. this piece and with your old Omega, and that is watches from. We're talking like high high end watches, like yes. luxury pieces, Omega, Rolex, in the nineties. Mm -hmm. So this is like kind of you know we're talking pre ceramic era. We're talking post crazy prices for Rolex. We're talking post ten sixteen Explorers, which you know are. Eight, nine, ten thousand for great examples already. Mm -hmm. Now, right? Mm -hmm. We're talking post 50, 55, 13 subs, which go, which have a crazy premiums, premiums. Well, we're talking about pieces that I've personally picked up, that Pat has picked up, like this Omega Dynamic. We're talking about a 1992 Omega Speedmaster that I picked up um, a couple months ago, or not even a month ago. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about the. 14060 Rolex No Date Submariner. Mm -hmm. um, we're talking about my Explorer, my 14270 Explorer that I don't have with me today. And these are all 90s pieces. We're talking about mm -hmm. SMPs, pre coaxial Seamaster Bonds, mm -hmm. which the Bond Watch. The you price know. on those, it's so odd because they're all fluctuating. They fluctuate they're... like crazy, right? But all of these, or not all these pieces, but the Bond Seamaster in particular can be had for well under $2,000. Well right? under. You and know. you have and you have a piece that's like an icon, a true icon in in the watch world, and something that's I mean it's just really cool to be able yeah. to like look at that and own one, you know. And the and what but are the Seamasters now are retailing <laughs> for you know high threes like four or something. I think you can get them maybe on the pre used market for a little under three. Yeah. But that's that's still kind of getting up. The lowest there, I've you know? seen is ceramic Seamasters, <clears throat> maybe. 
2.5. Yeah. And, you know, and guys, I know some people swear by, by buying new, um, but there's not only is this new vintage market ripe with deals, it's also ripe with quality watches. Exactly. Those pre-ceramic um, SMPs, the, the reference uh, that eludes me now, but it's the four-liner. This is not the Daniel Craig Bond Seamaster. Those are also um, like aluminum inserts. Uh, this is the... You're talking about the, the first batch of coaxials with the red with mm -hmm. the red letters? Yeah, and those coaxial movements are kind of a, kind of a bust from what I understand. They weren't yeah, well, bust. It, yeah, the coaxial, I mean, the coaxial movement in general... Uh, from my understanding is I mean this was something brand new mm. that they rolled out and they've been they've been um, better improving on them yeah. you know every every cycle that they have the new caliber you know XXX caliber XXXXX you know I wonder if those guys will hold and, value uh, but you know I don't know different different yeah story. that's a different story but um, well, what I'm getting at is SMPs because uh, I've seen some go as low as 1.1 like, like $1100 you know maybe yeah. not the best condition maybe not the box and papers you're definitely going to want to take it to someone to fix it up. But if you love your watches like we do, that's no big issue. You're going to want to get it regulated and cleaned anyways. Yeah. So why don't we start with a new acquisition? And this is uh, Adam <coughs> Sub. Yeah, so we'll kind of talk about this one a little bit. Um, this is another perfect example of a watch that is in the sweet spot right now. So as you guys know, the Rolex Submariners, they hold steel Rolex Submariners hold their value like no other watch on the planet. Mm -hmm. I mean, you if you buy right, you will not lose money on this. It's owning one of these is basically like owning a blue chip stock or like a government bond, you know? Like yeah. it's you have you have cash basically on your wrist. Um and it's kind of cool because so this one in particular is a 1991 model, no date sub, the 14060. Mm -hmm. Um and while you know, no date subs now, the ceramic ones um, retail for 7500 I think, for the no is date. Is that more and or less than the dated? It's the, the no date is less. The okay. the date one, I believe, retails for $8,300. Okay. Um, and these 14060s, if you go on the used market, well, you're going to have to go on the used market, you can find these guys for anywhere from four to $5,000. With bracelet? Uh, yes, with bracelet. So I got mine from a very well-known vintage dealer, head only, because I'm not a huge fan of bracelets, uh, unless the piece is right. Um, I got this for under four grand. So to own such an iconic piece of history, you know, in, in, in the watch world, a, uh, a no-date sub that looks pretty badass, I think, on a NATO too. Yeah. Has that kind of mill sub sort of look to it, especially with the clean dial um, and the no-date. Uh, under 4,000, you can have a really iconic piece. And it's really cool. It, it has a little bit of that vintage charm already still, even though it's it's a 90s piece because it's pre-ceramic. Mm -hmm. And Rolex is not going back to aluminum bezel, bezel inserts. Duffer. You mm -hmm. know, ceramic, they're, they're, ceramic is here to stay. Unless it's some sort of special <clears throat> edition, but they hardly do that. Right, so. exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, we have this one. The other cool thing... Um, I mean, another Rolex that I have too, the 14270 Explorer, uh, the 36 millimeter Explorer one that I got for head only for under three, three grand. So when people think Rolex, they're thinking, Oh, like five, six, seven grand, yeah. but you really don't have way to pay of, so much. Way out of my ballpark. Another, another numbers. perfect example of a nineties piece that is a great buy right now is the one, six, five, seven, zero, the polar or the black Explorer, Explorer two. So um, we'll kind of we'll throw up a little picture for you guys, but that's a watch that can be had on bracelet for under four grand. Um, if you if you go for a '90s piece, another really cool part about having these early '90s pieces is they didn't start using Luminova until 1997, I believe. Like '97, mm -hmm. '98 was the transition period, so you can get some really cool patina. Mm -hmm. on some of these watches if you're really into that look. Oh, you know, I love <clears throat> the patina of a radium and or tritium dial. Yes, exactly. So they and all had, all the Rolexes had tritium dials pre-97, uh, right? Exactly. So look at these examples here. <clears throat> so this now. one isn't, this one doesn't have, uh, this is not a good example of, of patina. What's interesting because obviously this person, um, <clears throat> they probably kept it in dimly lit areas. This is, hasn't, this hasn't seen much use. It hasn't aware. aged much yet at all. However, when you look at something like my Omega Dynamic <clears throat> Photograph, yeah, you know those uh, numerals are done up in tritium, and they've aged this beautiful sort of—I uh, don't want to say mustard yellow, 
there's no way to describe it. It's just like um, like dirt road yellow. Uh, and it's absolutely beautiful. And again, you can get this on a modern dial with <laughs> the, the people, obviously this trend is showing its significance in that all these companies are producing Super Luminova that looks aged. Yeah. Because they want to steal thunder yep. from new vintage and vintage pieces because people love that look. They're kind of right in the bandwagon too. You yeah, know? they know. It. And you know, there's there's no other way to reproduce that look unless you fake it. Yeah. Um, and I, I love it. I admire it. And people are concerned about how those things will age. Um, but I know how my Omega's aged. Like when I found this, it, it came like this. And that's because it's... You know, nearly as old as me. It's and guys, for this dynamic chronograph, we're talking about a watch that's right around a thousand bucks. So you yeah. get that awesome, cool vintage vibe from a piece that's it's twenty years old now. But oh, yeah. so it's not it's not you know too really vintage yet. But it's gonna it's getting there, and the patina is there. And that's one thing to note too is <clears throat> the Rolex is I don't know it has something to do with the um, I guess the the tritium or the the loom that they use. Some of the Rolex um, markers don't age as quickly, mm. but it almost seems like every Omega from the early '90s gets this really like yellowy, like mustardy, Beautiful. mustardy yeah. loom. And you guys can see that on my <clears throat> 1992 um, Omega Speedmaster Moonwatch. Um, so this is a reference 3590. Um, the most recent ones in the 2000s were uh, called the 3570, and now it's it's like a super long reference for that big box Speedmaster. But this is essentially the same watch, and I had a, a big box Seamaster yes. or Speedmaster, yeah. and I sold it because I used it as you know a trade bait for for uh, the GMT that I had back in the day. Mm -hmm. um, and once I sold that, I knew that I was gonna want a Speedmaster again. Mm -hmm. But I knew, I was like, I really want something with some really freaking sweet uh, patina on it. So I went for an early 90s um, a second. A Speedy. Really nice close up for you guys to have patina. That also was under three grand. So I know you guys are probably looking at the, uh, the hands and you're like, oh, the hands don't match the markers, like those are replacement hands. So the, um, when flashed with a flashlight, uh, this tritium actually glows just a little bit and the hands match the amount of glow and the duration of time the hands and the hours hour markers match mm. um which is kind of interesting and i've <clears throat> read and seen from multiple people that for some reason the uh the loom used on the speedy's hands <clears throat> doesn't age the same way as the markers do huh. so that that is in fact the or those are the original hands and you guys can kind of see um when Pat puts this up on the uh, on the camera, that there is a little bit of aging on that chronograph hand. You'll see kind of like a dull yellow, but um, it's not as dark as the hour markers, but they are in fact original. Yeah, so. but you also see that on this example here too. Um, it's interesting because these watches were made almost about the same time frame. Mm -hmm. Just but a the, five year separation. The loom on those sword hands on this dynamic I know, they, they show a little bit more aging, but they're actually lighter in tone than the dial itself, and that might just be how Omega loomed back then. I'm not certain as to why that's the case. Um, yeah. But, you know, you get these marvelous deals on these vintage watches, again, on designs that are no longer available and or are classics, and you're getting them for what I consider a very reasonable price. Yeah. Uh, particularly when you, you, you look at it from the standpoint of you're, you're making an investment. You know, when you spend this much on a watch, it's yes, you want the enjoyment and yes, you want the thrill of wearing uh, something, you know, not only iconic, but just masterfully crafted. Um, but you're getting that in a package that's, you know, you got this with the bracelet mm -hmm. at a really, really great rate. Yep. And, and less than you could for, you know, a modern a Speedmaster. Yeah. And to me, less. with something with a lot more character, it has Hesalite crystal. Now, my dynamic uses sapphire, but uh, you can tell uh, from the close ups earlier that this, you know, the Speedy is scuffed up. It, it shows wear, but those characteristics are actually really favorable in vintage, at least for collectors like us. You know, I love seeing that. And what's nice about Hesalite is you can buff that out. You know, it's not a big deal. Whereas finding a replacement sapphire might be a different story, but. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I mean, so basically what we're just trying to tell you guys is, is do your research on some of the cool 90s models because you can get that vintage look mm -hmm. without, um, without that crazy, yeah. without getting a reproduced uh, piece or getting that, that getting into those crazy, crazy vintage prices of watches oh. in the 70s and, Very true. you know, yeah. so because this, this watch, this moon watch that I have, um, <clears throat> You go up to some of the other Speedmasters from kind of the early 70s and late 60s, you know, with uh, with some of the pre-moon watches and then the, the 70s, 145, uh, 022s, and we're starting to get pretty pretty up in prices with the 321 Lamanias and all that. Um, mm. And this has that vintage look, but it doesn't command that vintage premium price, you know? Yeah, so, so if you're looking into new vintage, <laughs> this is a great way to invest in something that's going to both age beautifully and maintain value, at right. least in our humble opinion. And in our experience, Rolex and Omega have been the, the best kind of values relative to current yes. prices of some of the newer pieces and the old, old vintage pieces. And of course, yeah, I mean, there's plenty <clears throat> of other brands you can look into so guys, of course, um, you'll notice uh, only two names are really featured here, Omega and Rolex. Um, when we look at new vintage, we're, we're coming at it from the angle of an investment standpoint, um, just as consumers. Particularly also, uh, I, I, I really do love and prefer these brands because the craftsmanship is top notch, that uh, the movements are unique. Um, also, you know, the finish is second to none, really. When, yeah. when, you, when you're buying from such a big name, you kind of expect quality, and back then, as such was the case. But, um, guys, if you have some new vintage that you adore, any watches from the 90s, share those with us. I'd love to see what you guys are collecting, because, you know, I bet you there are watches more affordable than Omega that you can get with the same aesthetic. Right. And also a beautiful fade on that, that, that loom. You know, and I actually had a 60s, I'm sorry, early, early to late 50s Tudor. Mm -hmm. um, I believe with that with the Bombay lugs that had a beautifully aged radium dial and handset, and I wound up getting that. Uh, I'm not going to say the exact price, but I got it well under seven hundred dollars. You know, and that was using a Rolex Caliber Fifty Nine. This was back in the days when there was little disparity between Tudor and Rolex, aside from the case designer, because Tudor right. used a lot of uh, Rolex movements back then, and yeah. those movements were outsourced anyways. Um, because Rolex used to only make cases. But yeah. you can find really great deals, uh, vintage, vintage, true vintage, but also in the uh, new vintage category. Yeah. So gang, thank you for joining us again on another video. If you liked it, feel free to hit that like button. If you disliked it, that's okay too. If you want to see more content like this, feel free to hit the subscribe button. We put videos out twice a week, so you can come to enjoy those if you're a regular with us. Anyway, gang, thank you so much for joining us. Please leave comments down below uh, with any uh, new vintage that you collect and or like. Um, you can also follow us on Instagram and uh, hashtag ClockStockBarrel to share your new vintage pieces. I'd love to see what you guys have on the wrist. Um, I'm obsessed with this Speedmaster. I really want one. <laughs> if you have some, feel free to share them on there because I just want to see more speedies. I, I know it's funny, this speedy craze is sort of picking up these days in recent yeah. year, and uh, I understand it now. There's I another one too. Now. Some of the some of the speedy reduced and some of the yeah. other some of the yeah. other like 38 oh. millimeter Speedmaster dates. Um, I had a reverse panda. Mm. Speedy that I got for under fifteen hundred dollars. So you nice. know, and this the reference was thirty five eleven dot five oh. So you guys can look that up. Um, there's another perfect example of a really cool vintage Omega that also had had some uh, some patina on it mm. that was under fifteen hundred bucks in it and a great watch too. So so guys, it's out there. You know, this new vintage is out there, and now is definitely a time to buy uh, if you're interested. Anyway, guys, thank you for joining us. We'll see you on the next one.